Hello, minions, and welcome uh, back to Professor Awesome and the Minions of Doom. Uh, I am, of course, Professor Awesome, and today, on this exciting day in history, we have Linda C. McCabe, author of Quest of the Warrior Maiden, and she's here to talk to us about some uh, important events that happened uh, this year and uh, why we should care and what cool things we can do uh, to, to learn more about them. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. Glad to uh, be a minion of doom. Well, we're, <laughs> we're glad to have you on the side of doom. Um, yes. So, uh, I guess we're going to start today by talking about Charlemagne. Who's this Charlemagne guy and uh, why should I care about him? Charlemagne, or the French say Charlemagne, mm -hmm. uh, Charles the Great is known as the father of Europe, and he helped to unify the continent of Europe um, during the Middle Ages. Uh, the Germans call him Karl de Gross, kind of like that name a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, so Charlemagne, Magna meaning great in, in French. So Charlemagne, he was a king starting in 768 uh, when he inherited a portion of the Frankish Empire. But his brother Carloman had a little bit, and then when he died, very suspiciously young, um, in 771, then Charlemagne seized everything and then expanded the territory over the period of his reign. And he died January 28th, 814, at a very ripe old age for the time. Right. So uh, this will be uh, released on January 28th. So that would be today, this uh, yep. uh, or some years ago today. So like, <laughs> okay. if you were to take yeah. the, the Frankish Empire the Frankish territories, and, 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 and put them on a map of modern Europe, uh, what, what are we talking about here? He had, um, starting with the Pyrenees Mountains, where modern-day Spain is, through most of France, except for a little bit of Brittany, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then through Germany and into the Low Countries and down into a portion of Italy. And... When he died, he only had one legitimate son that li was living, Louis the Pious. And so he got it intact. And then when Louis died, it was divided into three sons. They fought, and, and uh, when they had their battle and divvying up the, the property, then it became basically France, Germany, and the Low Countries. So this is a, I mean, this was, this was not a small empire. There's a reason he's... Charles the Great or the Gross, right? Uh, yes. He's uh, meaning, of course, big or gro uh, great. Uh, it's this is this is huge. This would be a huge empire today, right? And um, he also helped to change the laws and education. It was called the Carolingian Renaissance for um, Carlos. Mm -hmm. So one one little trivia that I love is that. He had tried to standardize the hand for the, the monks when they were copying and recopying the, the texts because the handwriting was not standard. And so that was called the Carolingian Minuscule, which today it's, you know, child today is the uh, Times New Roman. Yeah. So now, and when we use the word Carolingian, the word Carol actually is Carolus, Charles, right? right. Yes. right. Yes. Which and is so, the Latin. And so when we say Carolingian, we mean like uh, pertaining to, well, to that whole kind of empire that he built, right? 
that and his successors. Right. So the the dynasty it was the Carolingian dynasty. He was considered the the founder of it, but actually his father Pepin Labreff was the first of the Carolingian dynasty to be recognized. Um, his grandfather Charles Martel uh, fought and defeated the uh, Muslims as they were going into uh, Europe, and he stopped them at the Battle of Tours in 732. But that's when the Merovingian dynasty, the long-haired kings, were still in power. And Pepin, when he became mayor of the palace, got really tired of doing all the work for a figurehead that just came out and waved. So he actually sent a letter to the Pope and asked, you know, who should have the title of king? He who does the power or he who inherited it? And the Pope knew who ran the armies that protected him, and so he gave it to Pepin. And so they deposed the last Merovingian king, and Childeric III, and they were called the long hair kings. So he cut this hair, tonsured him, and put him in a monastery. So he wasn't killed, but put away. Speak, speaking of popes, isn't there an interesting sort of uh, perhaps legendary uh, uh, story about how about Charlemagne and how, and how he became the, uh, the the head of the Holy Roman Empire? The right. Holy Roman? So in the year 800 on Christmas Day, um, he was in the Vatican, and this was right after the Pope had a trial to see whether or not he should be removed from office and Charlemagne was the judge <laughs> and so it was determined that the Pope was fine and he was rigged and, and set up by his uh, enemies and so the Pope was vindicated and then a few days later Charlemagne came for Christmas to the Vatican and was crowned Emperor of the Western Roman Empire and then his title went much longer than that. It was a really long, unwieldy title. And then later, centuries later, it was called the Holy Roman Emperor Empire. And so then he's thought of as being the Holy Roman Emperor, but it wasn't a title used at the time. So yeah. And there's a common, there's a, a legend which is probably not true, but I like it that the Pope uh -huh. sort of snuck up behind him and put the crown on him and made him king. Though politically, it might not have been far beyond that. Uh, it made him em emperor because, uh, uh, you know, nah, now you're the defender, so you really have to defend me all the time from now on. So Yeah. So, so one other historical tidbit, and this is kind of a little dark, but Charlemagne is considered to be the first Reich, and the second one was uh, uh, Napoleon, who then crowned himself emperor because he didn't want to get it from the state. Or from the church, so it's like, yeah. So, so, so Hitler is getting this idea from somewhere. From Charlemagne, yeah. who was also, you know, his symbol was of the eagle as well, because he was um, Frankish, but at the time it was kind of Germanic for him. So, yeah. yeah. So this is, I mean, January twenty eighth. This is the not a, like a round number so what, what is it 12 1203 years yeah 1203 years so it's not exactly a super round number no. for for that for Charlemagne himself but it is a round number for what a very round number for something else tell me well that. it uh, Orlando Furioso was a poem that was written about the legends of Charlemagne and so that was originally published in 1516 by uh, Ludovico Ariosto. So it's 500 and now just one year. Um, not exactly sure exactly when in the calendar it was published, but if anyone is watching this today on January 28th, you have one day to get to Ferrara, Italy <laughs> to see the end of an exhibition regarding um, Orlando Curioso at the Palazzo de Diamante. All right, so we have just <laughs> we have just squeaked in under the under the uh, the deadline for yeah. ooh, there we go squeaked yeah. in under yeah. the deadline for yeah. uh, 500th year. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, a 
I got this as a program from one of my exchange student sons from Italy. He had gone to see it. So. Okay. Well, like, that looks great. Okay. So tell me, what is Orlando Furioso about? What is, uh, what, what is it? Orlando Furioso was a massive epic poem that is about Charlemagne and his knights and it's following Orlando, the title character, in his unrequited love for a princess Angelica. And these stories, um, the Chanson de Geste, were told and retold for centuries in the south of France and north of Italy. And this is just one major contribution in that. And I will show, this is Orlando Furioso, an epic poem. And uh, for those of you who are listening on the netcast, it's, uh, she's got the Penguin Classics paperback version, but it's probably two inches thick. It's a nice, yeah. uh, pound for pound, it's a, it's a good deal in the book. 27 pages. I mean, there is an introduction. But the thing is, that's part one. Yes, right. There's a second volume, part two, which also has... I think it's bigger, isn't it? 793. Oh, only 793 pages. Right, because it doesn't have the same introduction in it. But the thing is... This poem is actually a, a sequel to an incompleted poem, which is Orlando in a Morato, <laughs> which was written by Matteo Maria Boyardo. And this book has over 600 pages in it. So it's the story of Orlando falling in love and then finding out that his love is not returned and going mad. That is the title of both of those books and of the of the our overarching love story unrequited of Orlando, who is a major um, paladin of Charlemagne. So and, the, fur, the furioso in this case doesn't mean furiously angry, but it means like essentially the title is Orlando goes goes nuts. Yes, kind of he it, did. Yeah. He became insane. He went mad, and it's described as him basically being feral, ripping off all his clothes, pulling up trees, ripping animals in half. I mean, he just went totally crazy. And in Furioso, one of the most uh, important, iconic sequences is a paladin going to the moon to retrieve the wits of Orlando because Everything that's lost on Earth is found on the moon, didn't you know? <laughs> so he comes back with Orlando's wits, and through a series of things, his wits are restored. And then his love for this woman is also gone. Okay. That is a, that, I mean, that, that's a really long story. Uh, so what is your particular interest in this story? So Orlando Furioso is not just Orlando's story. There are multiple heroes, multiple knights going off, knights errant going off and doing different heroic deeds and sequences. And when I was reading Orlando Furioso, I found myself being drawn to the love story of Bradamante and Rogero. And I had never heard of Bradamante. She is a kick-ass heroine from literature. And she's the niece of Charlemagne, who has her own command and is respected. And iconically, she is based on Joan of Arc and Athena. And she has a much better uh, character arc and ending than Joan of Arc meaning she wasn't tried for heresy and wasn't burned at the stake like Joan of Arc was. But she is called the maid. She is shown as riding on a white horse and with a white shield, and she's a virgin and all this wonderful, iconic stuff. But she meets and falls in love with a Saracen warrior descended from Hector of Troy. 
So they meet on a battlefield after the war is over for the day, battle is over for the day, and they fall in love and then are separated. So they are on opposite sides of a holy war and trying to get together with honor. And that's the most challenging part. There is a good chance that what you have just described is actually the plot of the upcoming Wonder Woman film. Uh, okay. It may, very well, it may very well be that. Uh, but, of course, this is... Uh, so, so, um, uh, so uh, what did you do with this story? Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your, so, your own work. Right. So, when I read Orlando Furioso and I'm reading this story about Bradamante and I'm thinking... Why haven't I heard of her before? Because I've, I've heard of Guinevere and her messy love triangle with Arthur and Lancelot. And I was wondering about Bradamante, and I, I felt more people should know about her. More modern-day audience should know about this wonderful woman from, from literature. So I decided to try to adapt it. So I'm going back and using both Orlando and Amorato, where they met the very end of book three and then through Orlando Furioso of their difficulty being together. Um, and I adapt it, you know, the, my story is looking at their, their love story and everything else that's in those poems that detracts and doesn't go along with it is um, edited out. It's, it's sort of like in the movie, uh, the karate kid when they're looking at the, bonsai tree and <laughs> mr miyagi says think tree daniels it's like <laughs> cut everything down to that so some of the side stories that didn't have anything to do um are edited out and other people if they want to adapt orlando furioso may go and and look at other parts of it and adapt that for modern day audiences so it's a, a done in a modern novelistic style and those areas where uh, the plot line was a little thin where Ariosto may have just jumped to something. Um, I padded it, maybe added some new characters and added more sequences to, to fill it out. So one of the things that like, and uh, the, the title of the book, your book is Quest of Quest the Warrior Maiden. Warrior right? Maiden, yes. Yes. And, uh, uh, oh, for those of the netcast, one, do you have a copy you can show? Oh, there yes. we go. This lovely book right there, Quest of the Warrior Maiden. And um, one of the things, and it's a, uh, I do highly recommend this book. Uh, one of the things that is, um, as I was reading through it, I thought, at the very beginning, even before I started reading I thought, um, if you're going to do this in kind of the novel form that we are accustomed to today, how do you make the characterization work where uh, it makes a lot more sense in a chanson de geste where you've got two people on the opposite sides of this war and somehow the whole holy war thing is not going to, it's going to be a problem, but uh, but not, uh, uh, but you're going to be able to, to have all this, uh, in essence, work out the way that it does uh, without getting into any kind of detail. Um, how did you... I don't want to get too much into writerly stuff here, uh, but how did you deal with the problem of, uh, I guess, in, in the big E sense, epic things happening uh, in a story where you have to make a modern audience feel like, and this could have happened like this in some way? So the, the poets were wonderful storytellers. They were bad historians and even worse geographers. So one of the things I did was try to nail down where these things happened. And when I saw things that didn't make sense geographically, I moved it. And I did go to France to see the places I was writing about. So part of it is trying to use um, historical fiction style to, to ground it in a time and place. Um, so I set it as starting in 802, and the time period for the poem is nebulous. You don't know when it is. So I've got historical details of 
the time and place and trying to ground it in that, but it is a fantasy where you have flying hippogriffs and magical realms. So when something doesn't work with physics, then I would use magic and trying to recognize these are, are, are humans, but they have heroic qualities. So I don't show anyone going to the bathroom, <laughs> but I do have them being overcome with hunger and just like this so they feel famished or they're exhausted they're not just tired but they're exhausted so it's like big items to make them heroic and so that was part of it and one small writerly thing is that i i chose not to use contractions mm -hmm. <laughs> so and that the language sounds a little more elevated Right, so you have the sense of the epic outside of the, or the chanson de geste, I guess in this case, uh, the, uh, you know, in the novel form. Yes. yes. Okay. All right, so, um, if, so let's say that I'm someone who is watching this, uh, uh, who's watching or listening to this to this uh, uh, podcast, and um, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'll, I'll read uh, Orlando Furioso or I've already read it for a class, um, and I'd really like to. I'd really like to see this. Um, what would be one thing that you would say? I mean, obviously, you know, you could give a, you could give the whole book to them, I guess, in a sense. But uh, what would be one thing that, as the author, you'd like to say? Like, I think that you should really uh, know this, or really, if you're reading Orlando Furioso for the first time or again, and you want to focus on a certain part, what would be something that you would say, this would be a great thing to notice, this would be a great thing to think about before reading my book? So, so one of the things with the title of my book, The Quest of the Warrior Maiden, if, if you think of Joseph Campbell and his, the hero of a thousand faces and the monomyth, that's generally a uh, prophesied hero raised in obscurity given a quest by an old wizard to save the, the world. And what I found so fascinating was that the quest was given to a young woman. And it was given in a cave, which is the traditional setting, but it was given to her by a crone. So she was being sent to go rescue her beloved who was being held in a castle by a wizard. And I just thought, this is an inverse of what we're expecting. Mm -hmm. And so her beloved Ruggiero is the prophesied hero raised in obscurity, but what's odd is that there's two different prophecies, two dueling prophecies, and so you have dueling magical forces trying to determine which one comes into play. So it takes what we expect from the hero, hero cycle and it changes it. And I love that. And those of you who are watching on the netcast uh, will notice, uh, only because I recognize the spine of it, that right over her left shoulder there is Hero with a Thousand Faces. Oh, you just shared <laughs> it with your... Sorry, your yeah, your left, uh, your left, our right, yes, right. I, 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 yes, right. Right. I've got so, lots of titles up there right. that you could see them well. You'd go, ooh, I want to read that. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Well, okay, great. So, uh, where can um, I would recommend uh, because I am cheap, and I hope everyone else is in terms of Orlando Furiosa has been in the public domain for a long time and so you can easily find a very very cheap used copy of both volumes uh and including the uh, uh if you want to read the prequel as well uh right. you, you can uh, uh, get that as well pretty cheap but where would one get a copy of quest of the warrior maiden uh i'll show it again quest more warrior maiden that is available through amazon um, Barnes and Noble, you can order it uh, online. You can get both in trade paperback or an ebook of it. Or if you prefer independent bookstores, you can go and you can order it from your local independent bookstore. So it's available both in the United States and globally through any of the Amazon affiliates. Okay, wonderful. So that's Quest, yeah. Quest of the Warrior Maiden by Linda C. McCabe, M.C. C.A.B.E. 
And yes. uh, anything else you want to add before we go? Um, so if you're looking to read Orlando Furioso, yes, you can read the old translations by, like, Rose that's free online, and it's very clunky, hard to read, hard to follow. There is a one-volume version by uh, Guido Waldman, which is prose, and if you look at this, it's really small font type, oh, wow. and if you've got aging eyes, it's hard to read. I prefer the one by um, Barbara um, Reynolds, and uh, it's in it's in uh, the verse, and I like that. That's the two volume. There's a more recent one um, by David R. Slavitt, and what I didn't like, it's very abridged. And so the Bradamante and Ruggiero passages, most of them are not there. They they felt that people only were interested in Orlando and Angelica. And so those did not, even though they were translated, were not included in it. And to me, his translation was a little too contemporary and it drove me crazy. I couldn't read very far in it. He said something, he had a verse where it was broadsword and then he rhymed it with cardboard. And I was like, oh. cardboard? <laughs> it's like, that's not for the period of when the Italians wrote it, and it certainly isn't true for the ninth century when Charlemagne lived. And so I, I couldn't take it, and I wound up giving that copy away to a friend. Nothing like a cardboard <laughs> reference to immediately take you out of a out of a, a medieval story like that. Right, and so I, I, I just couldn't handle it. So anyway, that's that's about it. Okay, well, I'd like to put you on the spot and get your commitment to come back on in 500 years for the thousand year anniversary of, uh, of and I want I want you to commit now to that. Okay, you're asking me to become immortal, and so certainly I, I shall do that, and um, I would love to come back when I have my uh, first sequel ready, so. Okay, Minions, you have uh, 500 years to, uh, <laughs> to read through the entirety of Orlando Furioso and uh, Quest of the Warrior Maiden. Uh, and so either until next time or that time, uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much.